uh, stop this plan, uh, asking Chugo Electric Company to stop construction for a while. But it is for a while. And the uh, Chugo Electric Company is not giving up yet. And they are saying that um, a ministry of, uh, no, Japanese government was saying that uh, so Japanese people are forgetting so quickly, maybe uh, from this summer we can restart. So, but I think depending on people, how they react to it, And uh, so I chose Sweden, and uh, many people talked about me that why you don't uh, portray Germany? Why Sweden? And uh, my answer is because sustainability. So Germany has a, a policy that they going to abandon all nuclear power plant, but not only nuclear power plant, Sweden is getting oil out. This is very important. Not only nuclear power plant. To be sustainable, you have to have whole energy shift. Without using nuclear power plant, what do you do? So this is a founder of uh, Natural step, Carl Henrik Robel. So she, uh, he is a kind of starter. Let's build a sustainable society, the first time in the world. And then uh, many Swedish people started argument, and then finally they said, yes, let's do it. And then this is a uh, uh, natural step uh, for system conditioned to be a sustainable. Uh, what, oh no, this is not, sorry. This is a uh, four system conditions for sustainable society that Carl Henrik Robert invented. Uh, concentration of substances of extracted from the earth's crust, uh, reduce it. Uh, concentra concentration of substances are produced by society, reduce it. Uh, degradation by physical means. And um, in the society, people are not uh, subject to conditions that system systemically undermine their capacity to meet their needs. So this is very simple. So they really teaching this idea in their educational system. So this is an image of Swedish people that let us imagine a sustainable society. What is a mature society? A society which can make the most out of limited energy. A society which does not use level of consumption as its indicator of maturity. A society where people can think and act together to create a sustainable society and solve the problem. So uh, this is a public bus using uh, biogas made from human waste. So everywhere in the Sweden, uh, public bus is running uh, using biogas made from human waste. And a taxi in Stockholm using ethanol. It's going to be 100% uh, by 2020. So now in Japan, we are thinking referendum about a nuclear power plant, what to do. And then recently, Tokyo uh, Metropolitan, people decided to vote uh, whether, whether referendum sh we should have or not. Then enough uh, si signature is uh, 220,000 uh, signature we, we achieved yesterday. We had the news. Yeah, so then uh, we do kind of a small referendum in Tokyo. But in, in Sweden, so this guy was driving car like this. Oh, is this a sustainable car? And then uh, made a many, many argument, whole, whole country. And, and uh, I think 
Still, TEPCO and Japanese government is hiding information so much. It is not open. It is not transparent. If we do tra referendum, we, we need to have a, a whole information transparent and, and should argue with this information. But I think it's not ready. And uh, this is a power in the film. Uh, using electric car, but electricity comes from only wind turbine. So this is a society we can choose. The choice made by people will change the society. So, but in Japan, we cannot choose electric company, only TEPCO. I don't want to TEPCO, but I have no choice. So this is a systematic problem. I think it, uh, we, we really need to fix it. So this is a myth of uh, safe nuclear energy. If I talk about like this, uh, everybody says that, uh, oh, uh, no, other, no other way except nuclear power plant can generate such big power. We need big power. And only such a small power by uh, wind turbine. But you know, the so quickly we can increase green power. And now we know how dangerous nuclear power plant is. So, and uh, also Japanese people uh, criticize what should we do about employment? But this is a calculation from uh, some uh, think tank that it says that the green jobs in renewable energy 2000 and 2030 from 20, from 2.3 million to 20.4 million. It rapidly in can increase. So this is uh, Japanese electric consumption. And then from 1965 to 2006, and uh, how much uh, electric generated by water and uh, fossil, fossil fuel and nuclear. We never needed nuclear power plant. This calculated by scholars, many scholars, maybe a couple uh, famous scholars calculated after Fukushima. We should have before Fukushima. <laughs> but uh, now we have this clear, and then uh, we can say no to nuclear because without the nuclear power plant, we can sufficient with water and fire for a while. So, you saw Tribune in, in Ashes to Honey, and uh, I asked him uh, in Japan, what should we do? And then he says that uh, the critical point of society uh, will come when 3% of its population change the way th they think. The point may come sooner than we expect, like a domino. So like a bottle of ketchup. You shake the bottle of ketchup, it doesn't come out, don't give up. Shake and shake. <laughs> <laughs> it comes up. So <laughs> this is my last message. Use your brain to be free from information, manipula information manipulation. It's manipulated so much in Japan. That's why I'm making this film. Yeah, thank you. So I might take a question, but uh, later. So quickly, I pass to Dan. Is it OK? Yeah, so Dan has so much to say. Because he has so much information about. Well, what a marvelous film. Um, it makes me remember uh, the fundamental sin that exists in all societies, Japanese, North American, or others, which is to be prematurely correct. The people of Ueshima uh, were prematurely correct about nuclear power. For nearly three decades, they have fought against the building of a nuclear plant 
in their community, believing it would devastate their way of life. And then on March 11th of last year, at Fukushima, the empirical evidence came demonstrating that they, the so-called common people, were right, and that the so-called experts, who had over and over again told them that nuclear power was safe, were wrong. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about what happened at Fukushima and what its lessons are for all of us. Um, Japan is a unique country in that it has suffered from the destructive power of the atom like no other nation on earth. Our nation, the United States, of course, dropped a uranium bomb on Hiroshima and then three days later on Nagasaki uh, with hundreds of thousands of people dying. The nuclear era began in August of 1945 with a vengeance. But in the mid-1950s, the United States began to argue that nuclear power could be tamed and we could convert the atomic sword into plowshares. We said that we would, there was a program called Atoms for Peace, that we could convert this destructive power of the atom into peaceful uses. And now, two-thirds of a century later, Japan is hit once again with a nuclear tragedy, again, frankly, brought to them in part by the United States, a number of boiling water reactors designed by the General Electric Company, the first one or two of them actually built by GE, again with us telling the Japanese that um, the atom was peaceful, the atom was safe, they should learn to love the atom. The experts associated with the industry and with the regulator, and a regulator very cozy with that industry, just as in the United States, kept telling everyday people that they simply didn't understand science, the modern world, the nature of our institutions, and that they were trying to hold out for a past that could no longer be preserved, that they were standing in the way of progress. And yet the people at Ueshima and many other parts of Japan and around the world who were deemed the ignorant said no and have resisted. And the events of March of last year, events which continue to this moment and will continue far beyond this moment, proved that they were right. So let's take a look for a moment at what happened on March 11th. This is what the Fukushima plant looked like before the accident. You see four nuclear reactors in a row. There are two others out of the picture. Each one of these reactors contained in it approximately 500 times the long-lived radioactivity of the Hiroshima bomb. The two reactors you can't see in the picture were more like 1,000 times that amount of radioactivity. Inside each of these reactor buildings, there was also what is called a spent fuel pool, a pool to store irradiated nuclear fuel that has been taken out of the reactor core after it has um, run for a while. And each of those spent fuel pools contained in it several multiples of the amount of radioactivity in the reactor core. So we're talking about a total amount of radioactivity that is thousands of times the amount of long-lived radioactivity of the Hiroshima or Nagasaki bombs. Now that amount of radioactivity has a tremendous value for people who are trying to produce electricity because in addition to producing radiation, it produces heat, thermal energy. And that heat can be used to boil water 
run a turbine, produce electricity. As we've often heard many times, uh, a nuclear power plant is simply a fancy way of boiling water. It tries to tame the power of an atom bomb to produce steam. And we know there are many other less dangerous ways of producing steam. The part that is difficult for most of us to understand is that the reactor which produces electricity needs electricity to run its pumps to cool the reactor so the fuel won't melt. And the reason you're concerned about melting is that when the fuel melts, that radioactivity, that hundreds or thousands of times the radioactivity of the Hiroshima bomb, can get out into the environment. So long as the fuel is cooled, you're OK. But if that fuel ceases to be cooled, it can melt, and radioactivity in massive quantities can be released. And so on March 11th of last year, an earthquake occurred many times larger than the reactor experts operating for the working for the utility and the experts working for the regulator had claimed was possible. Now you have to understand there's great pressure on a regulator to say that the smallest earthquake, the largest earthquake possible is much smaller than could really be the case because then if it's larger than that, you would have to put in a lot of additional safety features. So the earthquake occurred and it caused them to lose off-site power. They couldn't run the pumps, but they were able to start backup diesel generators. Those are your backup system to keep providing power for the pumps. And as best we understand the accident today, and this may change, about an hour later, a tsunami occurred caused by the earthquake. And that took out the diesel generators. They lost their primary power, and they lost their backup power. And the fuel started to melt. And in the process, they needed to get the pressure out of the reactor vessels, out of the containment structures, and they started to vent them. And when the fuel gets very hot, it produces hydrogen gas, and that hydrogen gas is explosive. And this is what you all remember happened. The reactors, one after another, after another, exploded. The hydrogen blew apart the reactor buildings. And so the containment structure that was supposed to contain the radioactivity failed. And radioactivity was being intentionally vented into the atmosphere and leaking into the atmosphere. And they had no way to cool this because the pumps wouldn't work. So they had to take seawater and using fire hoses, try to blow water into the reactors to try to get them to cool off. And you'll see in some of these pictures, steam rising. That's not a really good sign because that steam has in it entrained radioactivity. It is releasing radioactivity into the environment. And at the same time, the seawater that was being used to cool the reactor was then being dumped back into the ocean causing levels of some radionuclides to be a million times higher than acceptable levels in that water. When a reactor melts, some of the radionuclides become volatile. They go off like a gas. Radioactive iodine, which tends to concentrate in the thyroid gland and can cause thyroid cancer. Strontium-90, which mimics calcium and goes to bone and can cause bone cancer and leukemia. Cesium-137, a powerful gamma emitter, which can uh, irradiate the entire body. And so these go off in copious quantities. It's very hard to imagine how much radioactivity is involved. And when it gets out, as the old saying goes, it's very hard to get the toothpaste back in the tube once it's out of the tube. Once the radioactivity gets out of the reactor, it's out of the reactor. It's in groundwater, it's in seawater, it is in the air. And we are one planet. And this radioactivity does not stop at a 12-mile zone, declared the evacuation zone. Um, it just keeps on traveling. And so you see the steam again from these destroyed reactors. This is an absolutely unbelievable accident. In, the sense that 
as much as any of us was concerned about a nuclear power accident, the worst anyone ever talked about was an accident at one reactor, one. We never even thought you could have an accident really at one reactor and a spent fuel pool. But this accident involved three reactors that were functioning at the time of the accident, melting. And it involved up to four spent fuel pools. When you lose coolant in a spent fuel pool, the fuel can actually catch fire and burn. So you have a driving force that can drive off the radioactivity. We still don't know to this day whether that is what happened with the spent fuel pools. We know that three reactors melted. In the marvelous words of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff, the reactor cores at these three reactors are X vessel. It means they melted through the reactor vessel. The fuel is outside the vessel where the fuel is supposed to be inside the vessel. And is melting through the cement or melted through the cement base mat underneath the reactor vessels. The containments failed. The radioactivity kept getting released. So, again, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, but this is how a boiling water reactor works. You have to understand that boiling wa water reactors are very controversial. In the 1970s, three senior GE nuclear engineers resigned their jobs and their careers because they felt GE was sweeping under the rug the safety problems with the boiling water reactors. To save money, they built them with very small um, Excuse me, what did I do here? Someone help me for a second where the uh, laser is. Can you show me? Um, I began my work in an era where we used cuneiform symbols and clay tablets, so I apologize. <laughs> so, very small containment structure. Look, looks like an upside down a light bulb to save money. And because there's not enough space to contain the pressure that occurs in a meltdown, they jury rigged this wet well so that high pressure would go into these, uh, this donut and bubble through to try to cool it down and reduce the pressure. You also note that the spent fuel pool is inside the containment, elevated up here at a place that's very hard to get coolant to in case you lose power. So the reactor started to melt. They had no power. They tried to cool it off a bit by the venting through the wet well. They boiled away the water very quickly, and the fuel just kept melting. And as it got hot, it released hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas exploded, and they were blowing apart one reactor after another after another. And they had backup batteries to be able to try to cool things Batteries were designed and required to only operate for eight hours. In the United States, our backup batteries are only required to run for four hours. In either case, it wouldn't have mattered because they were out of power for days and weeks. So what did this mean? That's what it meant, this iconic photograph. Look at that carefully. It says everything about the nuclear era in which we live. You have a child terrified, hands up, being frisked with a radiation device by an adult saying, don't worry, everything's okay, but the adult's in a white suit with a mask. <laughs> don't worry. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but don't worry. And the problem was that they had very good reasons to worry. I'm going to just show you for a moment the effects here in the United States to give you some conception of how worldwide this is and how much the effect is in Japan. These, this is the RADNET monitoring system that the US EPA had in place at the time of the Fukushima accident. This is an emergency radiation monitoring network. Now you'll notice that there are three colors for the different radi radiation monitors. Blue, light blue, and white. 
Here's California. You'll also notice a couple interesting things, no? No radiation monitors between Los Angeles and San Francisco along the coast. But it gets better. Look at the legend. Dark blue were monitors that were running. The other monitors were broken, had been broken for months. Some got fixed a couple weeks after the accident, which doesn't do you a great deal of good. Many are still not functioning at all. Half the system was broken. Even the, the half that was working couldn't read radio iodine. Uh, it's a get, uh, elemental, it passes through the filters, only the particulate would have been caught. Um, to fix that problem, you may not be able to read this email, but this is an email I obtained from the Region 9 of US EPA. EPA has some detectors that are pretty capable, that can see radio iodine, these are deployable, and they decided they were gonna deploy them up and down the California, Oregon, and Washington coast in the places where there weren't other monitors. And then this email had to go out a week after the accident, apologizing, saying that headquarters, EPA in Washington, had decided not to deploy the deployable monitors. They sat in warehouses throughout the entire accident. Can't see very much in a warehouse. Don't worry about the table. These are the ra rain measurements in the United States. The red line is the safe drinking water.